Hey feelers, I hope you've been tuning in with me in episode five with John, our mental health expert. He's been giving such great and sound advice. So let's listen in for more. It's, um, well, I was gonna, the next question I was gonna ask you, and I think you, I mean, and you let me know if there's any additional things that you wanna say or touch on there. Um, because the next question I was gonna ask you was um, like, with like racial injustice, um discrimination like all of that as like a topic um is is it any different and you know thinking about like the history and communal aspect of it right is there yeah. any difference with that related to maybe like other um mental health issues that people experience um and then like what are the connections or are there any yeah. additional connections between that um, and mental health? Yes, and for way more complex reasons that I can even go into. But I think there's something to be said about the fact that the way that we practice mental health, especially in America, mm -hmm. is a very westernized scientific approach. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is, and because God has opened doors for me to speak at churches and different specific minority group churches, um, what I mean by that is a lot of people in different minority cultures do not have the level of appreciation or identify with psychological principles in the way that we've conceptualized it in America. So, for instance, I spoke at a Vietnamese church recently before this whole COVID pandemic, and I was faced with the reality that it's a shame on our culture, just like Chinese culture is, and they minimize what mental health symptoms are. So if you are experiencing certain types of mental health symptoms, that's more of a reflection subjectively as a reflection of your character and the fact that you need to overcome or work on certain things. And I know that that is something that's common among many minority cultures. Mm -hmm. um, I even spoke at um, an African Pentecostal church very recently. I gave like a talk and a group mental health seminar on like suicide specifically. And one thing that came up time and time again in our group discussion is, hey, in our culture, we don't talk about these things or we don't acknowledge them or when they come up, we just don't, we kind of ignore it or we suppress it or we push it back. Or pray it away. Mm -hmm, or pray it away. That was literally the most common example of what people, and this was a, this was a collaborative discussion with church members. So it had leaders and church members in it. And a large majority of people said what you just said exactly. And this happens across the board for different reasons, different cultural reasons across many minority cultures, which is simply don't acknowledge or there's a lack of education or access to resources in terms of being able to understand like what mental health is. And I'm literally about to be in a panel. We're talking about like mental health awareness. And I'm going to be talking about like depression. And we're also going to discuss suicide and anxiety and all these different things. But these are things minority cultures specifically don't address mm -hmm. um, in relation to racial injustice and how that connects with mental health. I think there's something to be said about how certain minority groups through generations, through centuries have had a lack of access to resources in the way that the perceived dominant culture or the white culture has. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is we know from like even redlining, the idea that maps were used where the government kind of redlined this area and decided that, hey, this particular neighborhood gets resources and this one doesn't. Oftentimes what that does is it, it segregates people based on so socioeconomic status and wealth. And especially if you're in a position where you're being discriminated against and you don't have access to higher paying jobs or being able to live in a certain type of community, your access to mental health resources as well are limited um, because you might either not have the financial resources to be able to afford mental health, it can be extremely expensive, or you might not even have like the insurance resources because we know, and I know this personally because I'm a private practice owner, I take Blue Cross Blue Shield, I know that only certain careers that people are in allow them to have Blue Cross Blue Shield and other people have other types of insurances. So that alone creates this delineation. You know what I mean? Yeah. So access to resources are limited. 
certain groups are placed at a disadvantage and simply don't have the opportunity or the privilege or the access to certain types of resources that other people in more privileged or more advantageous uh, groups are able to. So I would say there's a positive correlation between race and ethnicity and mental health treatment. And what ends up happening is because of a lack of resources, because of a lack of education, because of certain generational trends, certain groups, certain minority groups are being educated or given the valuable knowledge or insight on how to deal with mental health because they weren't taught, because they didn't have access to those resources. So they may or may not necessarily subjectively see the value or importance of it and therefore may continue that trend with their children and with their children's children. And this becomes a generational thing that happens over and over and over again. Um, I really have a deep level of respect for especially nonprofit mental health organizations that take the time to provide access and resources to low income and minority groups where they don't necessarily have as much access to resources. I really have a deep level of respect for that and for social workers that take time to serve that population. But we still have a very, very long way to go. And part of that has to do with the institutional racism that's gone on for so many generations and discrimination, prejudice, all these different things, particularly to minority groups. Yeah, this is this is a tough battle. And like you said, I mean, I mean, the whole thing is a tough battle and there are so many strides. Um like you said, but then so far to go. Um, and you've already kind of like said some things, but like, can you think of any other like um, like practical ways that we can move forward um, in, the, in this discussion um, about the, these issues um, in a practical way, move forward in a practical way from like the mental health and biblical perspective? Yeah. So the number one thing is creating a space where you can feel safe and you can have the openness and the freedom to be able to share where you're coming from. I think part of what frustrates people is the lack of ability to feel valued, to feel validated, affirmed, understood, right? And part of that has to do with the fact that I think a lot of people in general just don't know how to communicate in healthy ways. That's just like a fact. Yeah. So one, I think it's important to Can do I your research. Go read? ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And you said, you said, say that one, say that part one more time. You don't think a lot of people are able to communicate. Say it again. In healthy ways. In healthy ways. I, um, I love that you say that. And I think another aspect to it um, mm -hmm. is that um, not only do they know how or we, like I can't even speak there at times. I don't know how to, for sure, many times <laughs> that I don't know how to communicate in healthy ways. But on top of that, I think the added layer is um, being a minority, being a black woman, um, what being fearful of like what, if people will even hear the voice that I have. Mm -hmm. So even if yeah. I can clearly articulate it in a healthy way, will I be heard? And then that brings in more insecurities based on what has happened like systemically. <laughs> um, from, yeah. You know, sorry. I just had to yeah. I love that you brought that up. And I think that that goes back to healthy communication, right? So one key aspect of communicating in a healthy way with people is to identify your expectations. So let me, let me take a step back. So whenever people have discussions regarding race, racism, race related issues, oftentimes what happens is people don't feel heard. They don't feel validated. They don't feel understood because so many people go quick to problem solving. What can I do for you? What can I do to help? What can I do to fix this, to make this better for you, to help you feel better because I feel bad that you feel this way. And I'm trying to empathize with you, but I can't get to your level. So let me do something so that 
I can help you feel better because I feel really bad right now, right? Yep. That happens so often. The reality is one key thing, one key skill in communication is identifying your expectations early on in a relationship. And I actually heard this through a Focus on the Family podcast like years ago, and I use this with my couples all the time. It's called fix it versus feel it language. So essentially, there's two primary kind of approaches to providing supportive listening when you're interacting with someone. You either come from an emotion-focused standpoint where you empathize with, and the person who is trying to communicate to the other person wants to just be empathized with, be validated, to be affirmed for how they feel, to not engage in problem solving, but to just have someone who can walk alongside of them and feel what they're feeling in the moment, right? So that's feel it. Fix it is coming up with practical, tangible solutions for solving a problem um, offhand. So a healthy communication skill is to set expectations accordingly in the beginning of a conversation. Like, do I need you to fix it or do I need you to feel it? And that alone can help reduce a lot of conflicts because the expectation is communicated and set early on when you're even, before you even begin the discussion. Like, okay, I really just need you to feel this with me. Please don't try to fix it. It's just going to piss me off, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that. And I also think it's important for if you're going to get in a conversation that's related to like race related issues, Mm -hmm. because it can become such a heated topic, do your research, understand certain types of vocabulary, understand where people are coming from. Like, for instance, there's a difference between how people perceive racism versus prejudice, right? So a lot of people would communicate that racism can't exist between two minority cultures because to imply that someone is being racist implies that the person being racist is in a position of power. And a lot of people would subjectively perceive the white culture to be those in a position of power. Mm -hmm. Um, So understanding certain types of social norms and terms, microaggression, privilege versus white privilege, Mm -hmm. institutional racism, like actually taking your time to do homework and Coming in with at least a baseline understanding of certain types of vocabulary can also help foster a sense of safety and demonstrate respect because you're taking the time to appreciate and acknowledge how weighty this topic can be and what the implications are and inviting the other person to come join you in this journey. So, yeah, those are some basics. Yeah, that's uh, really sound. And uh, I think, you know, like our pastor has had to (laughs) implement a lot Mm -hmm. of things. Even myself, like I saw some things and and like I was livid. Listen, I was in my bedroom pacing the floor and I was like, okay, Lord, I know that these are my emotions and they are tripping right now. (laughs) So help me. Um helped me and you know I, I really believe that he did um and i won't go into detail we can talk online though um about that so i praise the lord for that um wisdom uh that you just shared and i think it's uh, a great contributor to um where we are and what we need to be doing what some of the things that we need to be doing um so like overall, you know, like of the things that we've discussed today, um, do you have like any resources that you can think of to share? And I can also maybe just like high level. And if there's anything that I can like drop in, like once this podcast is released, I can put it in the description <laughs> for people. Um, yeah. um, I do have some book resources that could be helpful. And also if we're talking about taking time to sit with and identify like how you're doing, how you're feeling. There's this sort of like model that I kind of created. So I'm more like visual and um, aesthetic and tactile when I work with patients. So I don't just sit there and talk to people. We do interactive things and their visuals. Um, But I created this sort of like 4D even diagram to help people understand. You're probably familiar because, but probably familiar with the biopsychosocial model. Okay. (laughs) 
I'm just curious. Okay. Right. So it's it basically holds this premise that in order to maintain a healthy baseline state of functioning, you have to look out for different areas of health and functioning, right? So your biological, your psychological, your social, and your spiritual health. So I just made this like 4D even diagram overlapping circles to help people understand contributing factors to like, you know, what happens if you're experiencing depression versus this. But I think it's a healthy model to kind of use to kind of assess like, how are my emotions affecting me like biologically, psychologically, socially, spiritually, mm-hmm. spiritually, how is it separating me from the Lord? How am I experiencing distance from the Lord based on how I'm experiencing in the present moment? I think part of sitting with and identifying how your emotions affect you is understanding how it affects you holistically. Mm -hmm. So I'll do this Venn diagram activity with patients sometimes and I'll have a clean slate and a whiteboard where we'll draw out like, okay, this is how it's affecting me biologically, whatever that is. And you talked about anxiety earlier. Anxiety also plays a role in our health as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw in a little, I'm going to go a little nerdy for a second, but there's a nerve system called the vagus nerve system that connects our stomach to our brains. Mm -hmm. And that's why when people experience anxiety, they experience gastrointestinal issues. Mm -hmm. There's a direct correlation between the brain and the stomach. So people get stomach aches, people have gastrointestinal issues, people can sometimes get ulcers if it's long over a period of time for years. There's a direct correlation between how we feel and how it affects our health when we look at it from a holistic health perspective. I but, keep it in my neck and shoulders. Mm, it yeah. Sick. Yeah. And that's that very that happens very commonly, especially with anxiety. It's the shoulders. You probably have heard of anxious breathing, mm-hmm. I would imagine, right? Mm-hmm. Where we breathe from like our upper chest area instead of the diaphragm. Yeah. That's where like you're accessing your blood cells are accessing less oxygen so that's what causes your heartbeat to rise your blood pressure to rise all these different things right Mm -hmm. our emotions affect our whole health which is why it's important for us to pay attention to it because it affects our relationship with the lord but it also affects how we function Mm -hmm. so you you have like an actual like a a like a, a thing like that you're willing to share is that what you're am I misunderstanding yeah oh. I could share it or I mean I could also just describe it and it's something as simple as creating like force overlapping circles and labeling each biological psychological social spiritual and taking the time to really identify like hey what are areas I need to improve in and grow in and what as a result of my emotions and my feelings, am I identifying as areas for growth? Mm, okay, that's good. I'm going to uh, start doing that. I love being able to um, like grow in this specific area. So and identifying <sighs> these things is, is a new um, thing for me. So any new tools, like I'm super appreciative. So thank you. Um, So my very uh, last question for you is, um, you know, we've discussed today, like, uh, like truth over feelings in very different ways. So like, what is your last little encouragement that you want to give to the people? Hmm. I would probably go back to emotions don't dictate reality. And the reality is at the end of the day, God is calling us to glorify him. So our emotions can oftentimes give us insight into deeper things that are going on inside of us. So we really need to take the time to really analyze and assess what those things are. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was so good for my, like my mind, my soul. And I really thank you for just taking the time uh, to serve me. I know you're super busy and you have, so many patients. So thank you for um, just blessing my soul. And I believe it's going to bless other people. Um, And what I've been doing with all of my guests is asking them, well, do you have anything else that you want to say before? Because I'm going to ask you to pray us out. Oh, yeah. Um, Not that I can think of. Okay. 
Well, thank you. And uh, if you pray us out, that'd be great. Yeah, for sure. Father God, thank you so much for another day that we are living and breathing. We have the ability to experience life and the natural general revelation of everything that you revealed to us given us the ability and the capacity to do so. Lord, thank you for this time that I get to spend with the sister in Christ. I thank you and I praise you for how you are continuing to work in Sharina's life, how you have embedded and instilled in her heart passions and desires to glorify you. Lord, I pray that through this ministry, through truth over feelings, that you may continue to draw people towards you, that you may continue to draw people towards your kingdom and to the reality of who you are. I pray that um, as people listen to these podcasts, as people listen to these interviews, that they may be brought back to the simple reality that, that they are in deep and desperate need of a savior and that you are available um, to help restore us and to heal us from the, the brokenness that we experience on a heart level. Lord, I pray for people that um, that are listening to this particular podcast, um, for different communities of people with different struggles that you may be convicting in certain ways. Lord, may you invite brothers and sisters in Christ into each and every viewer's lives um, to be able to process certain things, things that are difficult, things that are challenging, things that um, are causing them to wrestle with who they are in Christ. Lord, I pray that an identification in Christ makes priority and precedence each and every person's your sense of amen amen uh thank you again so much john i really appreciate it um again i just don't take lightly uh the time your time and uh spending with me and talking about these things um i, I know you're so busy so i really appreciate it and i hope that uh you join me again sometime um i hope this isn't the last time so thank you yeah. Thanks for having me. Hey, feelers. This was the end of the whole episode with John, our mental health professional. He's a great therapist and a good friend. Uh, the Lord has really blessed him and gifted him. And I hope you got some great wisdom and nuggets from what he shared. Um, I was truly blessed by it. And I thanked him afterwards for not charging me for a session. So thank you again, John. Um, until then, I hope you all um, can build a community around this. I created a Facebook group, so feel free to join my community. Let's talk about our feelings. Let's explore what's going on in our hearts. And then for sure, let's challenge each other and encourage each other in applying God's truth to those feelings. Until next time, please like, comment, and subscribe. Love y'all. Bye.